All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday Morning Bible Study on this April the 30th. <clears throat> we are back. Um, today, we are starting up at Jeremiah chapter 23, and we got up through verse uh, 22, okay? Um, and I, uh, I will say that on the YouTube playlist... Uh, of of this Bible study of all the uh, sessions we've had, um, yeah. the playlist is now fully up to date. Um, that is to say, last week's session was session twenty five, um, and so in it is posted. All of them are all twenty five are posted, um, and so um, I'll send you the link for them for that playlist again. What you might want to do is um, <clears throat> when you get it again, you might want to bookmark it, uh, bookmark that particular playlist, because, you know, as I say, every week, new new sessions get uh, get added to it. All right. All right. So we're in chapter 23. We're starting at verse 23, but um, kind of uh, continuing that um, pre-recording conversation that we were uh, talking about the uh, about the righteous branch and the uh, and the uh, false prophets of the false prophets of hope denounced. That's the heading in my Bible, uh, starting at verse back in verse nine. Um, the business about the righteous branch, you know, this you know, given <clears throat> we were one of the one of the most important things we said last week was that the apparently chaotic arrangement of Jeremiah where you have you you have a you know a word of doom and a word of hope kind of put side by side and and we know historical scholarship you know can can tell you that that those two parts one of doom one of hope and then and then a, and then another one of doom were not necessarily written at the same time uh, they were not, uh, in fact, and some did not even come from the life of Jeremiah himself, that some of them actually were later editorial uh, additions from the exile, or even, in some cases, even from after the exile, uh, from the points of view of people that knew how certain things would turn out, uh, would know how, for example, the Babylonian invasion would turn out you know not not that it took any great foresight to <laughs> to 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 know how it would turn out but but nevertheless people living during the exile or after the exile knew full well what happened um but the point is is that the the final version of Jeremiah you have these these different pieces with different messages from different times all put together and we we offered the um, the possibility that from the point of view of from the point of view of the final editors who were presenting this composite work as you know a canonical a canonical scripture um, that the arrangement was not nearly as haphazard and random as it may at first appear and that in fact there's a there's a a potential reason for putting messages of hope and doom and then hope again side by side, even if they're from different times and with different messages. Um, <clears throat> and but the the business about the righteous branch, you know, obviously is a is you know one of the more hopeful pieces of this puzzle. Um, and it does look forward to a looks forward to a kind of ultimate restoration kind of ultimate, a kind of ultimate healing and ultimate uh fulfillment of the people of israel we've not yet come to uh chapter 31 uh where we're going to see uh a particularly memorable statement of that new day, uh, where it's where Jeremiah, where where the book actually speaks of a new covenant, 
that will be made. Um, but it's but it is certainly of the same family, the same genus as those that speak of a righteous branch and so forth. That is, as, as Carl very rightly said, it, it is uh, something that is messianic in its in its very in its very nature. Um, is the narrative, the author of the narrative and the poetry, uh, is it, does it appear to be the same writer? We know that the, the, the thought is that Baruch was essentially the poet, uh, but was there, was there a, a Jeremiah who was doing the, the, the narrative collaborating with Baruch? I mean, what, 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 did, what we did don't really know. About? Yeah, we don't, we don't really know. For sure, we we do know that there are hands that go beyond the historical life of Jeremiah and Baruch. Mm -hmm. uh, there are hands involved now. How much of that is harder to say? It's it's easier to say um, when something is dated, you know, like like a particular passage when that text might have been composed. But it's much harder to say who did it. Uh, or how many, how many hands were involved in doing it? Uh, we don't, we don't know. Um, at the end of the day, what we what we really are studying is less Jeremiah himself, Jeremiah the, you know, the biography of Jeremiah, and much more the composite book of Jeremiah as canonical scripture. Uh, given that there are that the that the final work does contain pieces from different times and and from different hands but that somebody felt it important that all those pieces belong together um and 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 so at the end of the day what we have to study is what we have before us and there's only so much we can say about you know the actual historical life of Jeremiah uh, although we can say, you know, a fair bit. Um, so the righteous branch, of course, is a piece that is more hopeful. Now, the the false prophets of hope, um, they have been with us uh, to some extent from the beginning because they have been the ones who have been <clears throat> have been opposing Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah has been declaring that that the elites and that the people sort of corrupted through the work of the elites that that the the covenant people have disregarded the covenant and we've we've spent a lot of time talking about exactly what that means what that looks like um but that they they've disregarded the covenant and that this calamity that is coming on to them is a is a divine judgment for uh for this disregard of the covenant um what these what makes in this context what makes a false prophet false is that they claim to speak in the name of the lord more often than not, they are, or most likely, they are people in official positions. They they're sort of like the royal, or I'm sorry, that like the priestly religious wing of the royal the royal establishment, and they are <laughs> very possibly from sincere conviction, <laughs> but are telling the king <laughs> telling the king and by extension telling the people that they don't have anything to worry about that everything is okay god is going to stand by them god is going to protect them god is would certainly never let something so horrible as the babylonians destroying jerusalem certainly would never let that happen and they're they're telling the king this and by extension telling the people this and jeremiah is saying against them no you guys have disregarded the covenant so often so pervasively 
that the judgment that a judgment is coming, a reckoning is coming, and there's there's really very little you can do to stop it. Hey, there, 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 there are two two elements that that, that I that I see in here. One mm -hmm. is uh, the the law of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. that is the, mm -hmm. the, that right? The religious, that's, that's, the religious that's, structure uh, yeah. is that's that's being that that's a problem. The other right. problem is we have a social structure where the poor are not being tended to. That's right. That's right. Uh, which is which is part of part of the religious imperative. Right. That, so, that, well, those two pieces, those two two pieces are bound up together. I mean, the two things exactly. you just said are bound it, up it, together. Yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. So the so the elite uh, could be following much of the law, uh, but ignoring the poor. Mm -hmm. so, so it's incomplete. Oh, yeah. In the, yeah, that will be. Yeah, yeah. For example, they might they might very well be doing all the sacrifices just right. Yeah. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, as I said in my sermon this past Sunday, they they uh, the one of the pervasive problems that the um, that the uh, 700s BC Hebrew prophets pointed out was that the people had a knack for getting the sacrifices right, saying all the right prayers, uh, you know, doing all the outward ritual stuff right. Mm -hmm. But then getting, getting the, the ethical obligations towards the the marginalized and the oppressed and 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 the the weaker members of society, they were getting that completely wrong, and um, and 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 God's response to that in the 700s BC and now in in the 500s BC or in the like 600 BC or so, uh, is you know <laughs> what 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 am i asking you for i'm not asking you for these rivers of sacrifices i'm not asking you for your firstborn I, i'm i'm alluding to micah of course you know i'm not asking for your firstborn i'm i want you to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your god and you know you figure that part out <laughs> we can talk about the rest of we can talk about all the ritual stuff later you know i mean, I mean all of that stuff is kind of secondary to the ethical the ethical and moral obligations that we have to one another uh, in community um and that's at the heart of what jeremiah is saying you know in his own time or what this what you know what this uh what the covenant issue is in in this time too um uh, and um uh, and so consequently uh but 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 the royal elites the and the royal and the priestly elites kind of are in cahoots with one another they're I mean, they're kind of supporting each other they don't see they don't see that they've that they're doing anything wrong they and they may very well be be blind to the ways in which they're trampling over over marginalized peoples or over over ordinary people poor people um in a very sincere fashion i mean that is they, they may genuinely not see it you know they, they don't necessarily have to be you know uh thinking oh you know how can we how can we screw over poor people today you know kind of kind of mentality they may really just not get it for all we know um but they don't get it if they if they don't get it, they don't get it, and th nevertheless, those those uh, things are happening, and the uh, and Jeremiah is pointing it out, and he's oh. saying that these these things have happened for too long, they're too pervasive, they corrupt, they have corrupted, um, they've corrupted community so much and so long that we've reached a point a, a kind of point of no return. And that the judgment is coming, and there's really nothing, nothing you can do to change it. Um, and thus we have these passages, which which may very well derive from a time when the Babylonian incursion has already started. You know that it's already the, the Babylonians are already there, but 
but words that say, you know, where, where God is speaking and saying, I'm going to leave your bodies out for the birds of the air and the, you know, I mean, it's stuff that's really harsh, really hard stuff to, to read and to hear. Um, Tom, that it, but that it's all too late. Yeah. Tom, Tom, was this an economy that was based on, um, on money or was it more based on trade or barter? Because if you're talking about, about justice and marginalized and oppressed, um, is it because of money or is it? Uh, it's, it's economic. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly economic. economic? I, I don't know that I'd want to get into whether, you know, we're, we're talking about coinage. Uh, we're probably not talking about coinage. Um, but are we talking, we about, are talking land? about economic relations? Yeah. We're talking we're, about, are we talking about land? Uh, I a mean, little piece of land? Yes. Yes. We're talking about, we're also talking about animals. Yeah, we're talking about land. We're talking about animals. Um, you know, in every in every age, there has been a tendency for people for people to go into debt, uh, been forced into debt, and to lose to lose lands. To this lose is their land. of, this is one of the reasons why uh, you have the uh, text in Leviticus in Leviticus twenty five about the jubilee. Year. Uh, no evidence that it was ever followed, but that there's a provision within within the law, within the Torah, for every for every fiftieth year for lands to return to families that have lost their mm -hmm. lands for for debts to be forgiven. And this, what this, I mean, aside from its divine origin, that the the belief, I mean, the, the, the theory behind it is that human society being what it is, injustices have a way of accumulating over time and that people are going to, you know, kind of in a natural way, human beings, what they are, the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer and that the provision in Leviticus 25 is meant to be a corrective to that. You know, there's some, there's some kinds of things that in ordinary human economic relationships can't necessarily be prevented. Certain things that can't be stopped, but they can be corrected. If a community and a community's leaders have the will to do it. If they have the will to do it. And so this is in the law. It's in Leviticus. Or I mean, check it out sometimes. It's Leviticus 25. And that was that was the idea is that every 50th year there would be a Jubilee year and lands would go back to to the families that that lost lands through sort of the the, the the natural the kind of natural injustice is built into human nature and the system. Um, it was meant to be a corrective. Of course, it rarely, if ever, actually got implemented. And the reason is because the people who would have had the power to implement it. Did not did not have any personal incentive in implementing it. Uh, the haves did not have any did not feel any particular uh, incentive to give back to the have-nots uh, because it yeah. it wasn't in their economic interest to do so, and thus you in a way you have played out in ancient Israelite history, you have essentially the human condition. <laughs> you have essentially the human condition uh, uh, played out before our eyes. Um, Tom, Tom, but yeah. there, were, there were also, uh, this was essentially a, 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 an economy that uh, uh, depended to a large degree on, 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 on slavery, that is people who who were in bondage, 
and uh, so and and surely there were there were there were Canaanites among them. That is, it wasn't all just Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, I really struggle with what the social structure was. Uh, mm -hmm. Were the poor starving? Uh, were the children starving? Were they were they sickly? Uh, uh, yeah. Were they were they simply dying young because they were overworked? Uh, 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 yeah, we 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 don't know. I mean, we yeah. simply, we simply don't know. Um, the uh, now we do know we do know um, that, and and from the from the scripture itself, we know that once the people were back from exile, you know, like hundred years, hundred years later, uh, people are back in the land and you have a situation that Isaiah 58, so-called third Isaiah is responding to. And he's pointing out that many of the old problems that got <laughs> that, you know, from the prophetic point of view, got the people into the dire straits that they got into with the Babylonians uh, that some of those old injustices were creeping back in. And we get a snapshot of that in Isaiah 58, where it speaks of um, employers withholding from their laborers their their, their laborers' just, just payment. Um, Which would probably be in crops, perhaps. Very possibly, yeah. 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 Uh, but withholding, withholding uh, pay, uh, making their workers work on the Sabbath. Uh, and and I don't know if you missed this uh, study or not, but when we were talking about, because Jeremiah was on the Sabbath in an earlier, in an earlier passage, and we saw that um, one of the problems with the Sabbath, one of the problems with the uh, uh, Sabbath obedience was the fact that it wasn't that God just had some kind of big hang up about, you know, not working one day of the week, but it was about, it was about people who had the power over other people's lives, um, making them work, you know, out of, out of, you know, the, the, the business owner or the property owner's financial interest, making his laborers work. Uh, on a day that was supposed to be set aside for the Lord, and that the reason the day was set aside from the Deuteronomistic point of view was precisely because was precisely because of the the risk of oppression. Um, and so, in the in uh, when that commandment about the Sabbath is given in Deuteronomy. When that when that when that's given in Deuteronomy, the rationale is that once upon is that you Israel once upon a time were slaves in Egypt, and when your boss told you to go to work, you didn't have a choice, you know, and you had to do it. Well, now as a, you know, as part of who you are now as a free covenant people, you have you have been given the divine gift, the divine command of one day that you dedicate wholly to the Lord and you don't work. And, and that was meant to be a gift, a grace, you know, not just, you know, not like, uh, uh, you know, like, oh, shoot, I can't go to, <laughs> can't go to Chick-fil-A today, you know, or something because they're closed on Sunday. No, it wasn't meant as a burden. Uh, and it certainly wasn't meant as a burden in the way that it could become in later time where people are so concerned about not doing a deed of work, you know, that the, that originally the point was to set people free. They, they had the privilege, the privilege of not having to work of not having to go into the fields of not being forced to forced into labor with that you know you know every mm -hmm. every unending day um and so and so it was a divine gift all right let's let's uh let's get into get into the text for today i mm -hmm. but i did want to address those things those things were important all right so let's look at uh we're going to start at verse 23 in chapter 23 23, 23. <clears throat> Excuse me, Tom, which chapter? 23. 23. 
Yes, 23, and we're going to start at verse 23. 23, 23. Okay. <clears throat> Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the parts of the prophets ever turn back? those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart. They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? See, therefore, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words from one another. See, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their own tongues and say, says the Lord. See, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, says the Lord. <clears throat> and who tell them and who lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or appoint them. So they do not profit this people at all, says the Lord. And let's continue. Let's read through the end of the chapter. When this people or a prophet or a, priest's, a priest asks you, what is the burden of the Lord? You shall say to them, you are the burden and I will cast you off, says the Lord. And as for the prophet, priest, or the people who say the burden of the Lord, I will punish them in their households. Thus shall you say to one another among yourselves, what has the Lord answered, or what has the Lord spoken? But the burden of the Lord you shall mention no more, for the burden is everyone's own word, and so you pervert the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you shall ask the prophet, what has the Lord answered you, or what has the Lord spoken? But if you say the burden of the Lord, thus says the Lord, because you have said these words, the burden of the Lord, when I sent to you, saying, you shall not say the burden of the Lord, therefore I will surely lift you up and cast you away from my presence, you and the city that I gave to you and your ancestors, and I will bring upon you everlasting disgrace." and perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. Okay. All right. We have a definition for the burden. That's great. That's good. Good. I was, I was anticipating that question. Yeah. My version Same says word. message. My version uh, yeah. Of the message. Yeah, message, or uh, I, I guess the more kind of the more uh, traditional word would be oracle, an oracle. Um, that is that is understood an oracle understood to be of divine origin, something of a message of divine origin, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, the uh, and 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 it's interesting. It's kind of a wordplay in Hebrew. The Hebrew is uh, masa, and uh, and the word uh, the word can mean burden, but it also means, as I say, oracle or a divine message. Um, and the uh, you know, as you can see, the the problem here, the problem here is that people are claiming that something is a divine message when it is it is not actually coming from god it is coming from one's own inclinations one's own prejudices one's own assumptions you know it's not coming from god uh 
you know, for example, somebody comes along and, uh, you know, say somebody has uh, 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 racist beliefs and, uh, and then espouses racist beliefs and says, you know, this is the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, you shall exclude black people from your, from your community or something, you know. That, that is a message that does not come from the Lord, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that, is, that is not a message from the Lord. It is a, it is a message out of your own, your own mind, out of your own heart, out of your own built up, built up assumptions or prejudices or whatever, but it does not come from the Lord. And yet one may claim that it comes from the Lord. And in fact, a person, it, I mean, it happens. A person can be so self-deceived that they really believe it comes from the Lord. <laughs> I mean, they may honestly believe that it comes. I mean, they, in a sense, they're sincere. They may honestly believe it comes from the Lord. Uh, when in fact, from the divine point of view, from that it doesn't, in fact, come from the Lord. And this is this is where this is what's going on here in in this uh, in this wonderful passage. Um, it's striking right at the heart of the plague of what we've been talking about: false prophecy. Um, a lot I used of that on college campuses now too. They don't claim it's coming from the Lord, but they certainly are attacking the Jews uh, heartily, and well, they're claiming to have the righteous position. Uh, I don't know if it's based on their religion or not. Some of them, I, I suppose, it is. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, yeah. there's, there's, um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of confusion all the way around <laughs> on, on. Uh, both both on college campuses and in the response to the college campuses. I think there's a lot of a lot of confusion going on and a lot of um, there's not a lot of dialogue and there's there's a lot of people strongly stating strongly stating positions and not a lot of listening. Um, I, I, I don't I may not see it quite as simply. <laughs> <laughs> see it as, as something that's so black and white um uh, apparently not but i do <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I, you know so I, I i see it very clearly it's it's anti-seminism black and white <laughs> oh yeah, yeah no i i do I, I i this is one of those times i would love to sit down with you in Carrollton. uh go to love... go to that uh what was it the applebee's that we used to go to uh not applebee's uh Chili's or it was anyway. We go and, and we could we could talk yeah. these things out. Uh, <laughs> and we might we might one of us might come closer to the other. Uh, you know, you know as individually. They, I do see it different. I do. Yeah, it may not surprise you. It may not shock you that I see it rather substantially differently than that. Well, um, it it does surprise me that you see it substantially differently, but not that you see it differently. But well, you, you well, know, I, I say substantially. I I think I think that the I think that what's going on here, I mean, without de de um, getting off subject too much, I'll just simply say that I think that it's, I think to characterize the protests as, uh, you know, as just anti-Semitic, I, I think is, I do substantially disagree with that. Uh, I think that they're, I think that protesters protesters here they're a mixed bag they're a mixed bag of people i have no doubt that on the fringes on the extremes of it there probably are some genuinely some genuinely anti-semitic elements or anti uh anti-jewish i don't like the word anti-semitic in this context only because everybody in this conversation is semitic the palestinians are semitic also yeah <laughs> they're all semitic so uh you know but uh but you know i have no doubt that there are there are certainly fringe elements uh involved in some at least some protests that are genuinely and genuinely anti-jewish in a in a in a in a racist sort of way in a hateful racist sort of way that said anti-zionism is not anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is not anti-Jewishness. 
at least not is, these, at least not kids, at least not explicit at least not uh, the, necessarily these jewish kids on the college campus have as much to do with what's going on as i do that's the problem they're attacking the wrong people you know they don't have anything to do with that well well the, <laughs> the thing to thing another important thing to remember too is that, that a goodly number I don't know. I, I don't have hard numbers to support this, but I mean, a, from what I can see, a goodly number of the protesters on the campuses are are Jews themselves, uh, are Jews themselves who who vigorously disagree with the policies of the nation state of Israel, um, and. You know, and and I, and as we have talked about on a number of occasions throughout this Bible study, there is, I think, you know, I think there's a lot to legitimately criticize about the policies of the nation state of Israel. Um, I think there are some people on the other side, on the other side of this, the the hardcore hardcore Zionists, who do see any criticism of Israel as intrinsically hateful which I think is just rank nonsense. I think that's just complete nonsense. Because if that's true, you would rule out, basically, you would rule out about the entirety of the Old Testament <laughs> as being, as being. Yeah, I, as you know, as you know, I'm not Jewish, but I'm very anti-Hamas and very anti-hostage oh, and very anti-terrorist. And absolutely, so I, you know, every, uh, and every decent it, human being should be anti-Hamas. And should be should be anti Hamas and, and anti terrorism and and I, absolutely hundred percent hundred percent. I think it's uh, but but you know but to but to say that all criticism of the nation state of Israel is anti is is hateful or 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 all anti Zionism is necessarily anti Jewish, I think is I think is just silly. Uh, because to say that it would be to basically, if you're being honest, being consistent, you'd have to you'd have to say that almost the entire Old Testament is anti-Jewish, because the nation state the nation state of you know the political arrangement that is Judah or Israel. I mean that's the whole point of the prophets. The whole point of the prophets is criticism. And, and see, this very much reminded me of what what's going on in the lesson. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. I, and, yeah. And I think yeah. and I think you're right to see that. I think you're absolutely right to make that connection, because it's is that you know one can have, as Jeremiah had, a deep love, a deep love for his for his people, the the fact that this. That this divine judgment was coming broke broke his heart. It absolutely tore him up that this was that this was happening, and 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 he would not escape it. He would be caught up in it. He wouldn't be standing far off watching it happen. He'd be right caught up right in the middle of it. It was absolutely breaking his heart and tearing his life apart, and yet he felt compelled by divine you know by divine command by divine call to say you know israel and he's and he's mostly thinking the the leaders he's mostly thinking you know the elites the political and the religious elites um uh, israel you have really really gotten this stuff wrong and the stuff that you're experiencing now is 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 part is in large part your own doing. Now, if somebody said exactly the same thing, <laughs> came along and said exactly the same thing uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu's government, or 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 said it in America, how would how would, for example, the American media respond respond to that? How would how would how would how would Jews respond to that? Well, some Jews, some Jews would say, "You're absolutely right. Netanyahu is is has led us down a terrible path. This is, you know, that you have to, you do have to fight Hamas, but you know that this response has been has been over the top. You know, this response and the way the, this war is being conducted has been over the top, um, and that it is that at the end of the day, this." pursuing this policy 
is going to end up doing far more damage mm -hmm. than less. It's going to do end up doing far more damage uh, than than bef than before, um, and that is, you know, I mean, there Israel couldn't necessarily prevent Hamas from you know making that first attack, but they are Israel's policies are are going to have the effect of creating more terrorists than they could ever kill they're 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 they're, they're making their own they're making their own situation worse by by the policy they're pursuing and to point that out to to, to say that is not anti-jewish it's pro-jewish it's pro-Jewish because I I want Israel to work. I want I want the nation state of Israel to survive. I want it to thrive. I also want it to be able to live at peace, you know, of, eventually come to a place where it lives at peace with its neighbors. And one of those neighbors, in my in my view, should be a should be a, a free state of Palestine. Yeah, and pointing pointing that out is different from blocking the Golden Gate Bridge for six hours and O'Hare Airport yeah, for can't. six hours and the Brooklyn Bridge for six hours and you know that's well yeah, yeah that. that's where there and are that's different where ways to point things out and those yeah. are not the ways to get my sympathy yeah. and that's where <laughs> and that's where my 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 <laughs> self described substantial disagreement with you uh, is morph morphs into a um. I I kind of agree with you. <laughs> you know, where, where I go from substantial disagreement to to I kind of agree with you. Well, uh, you know, I I, I have my yeah. rights, but when I tread on your rights, then I'm wrong. Right. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> um, thank you for the thank you for the discussion. I'm coming to Athens, but you're buying. Yeah. Yeah. I want I want to go way back. Okay. Uh, this this social structure was established really. It was initiated by David. It was established by Solomon. Mm -hmm. That is, th there was an elite. Uh, the mm -hmm. Jews themselves had to volunteer one month labor to the state, unpaid, mm -hmm. slavery. That mm -hmm. was always resented later on. Mm -hmm. So this, so now we're two hundred years later. Oh, more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Three hundred, about three hundred. Yeah. yeah th th this this situation has been festering. Yes. Uh, Josiah brings us back for a while. We're we're assuming he 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 was more egalitarian. We're, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're not we're not quite sure what he did. Uh, whether whether he really responded to the poor, whether it was better, whether there's a uh, we 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 assume that at least he observed the Sabbath. Right, right. Okay. So so now so now uh, the, the the invaders are at our doorstep. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we rationalize that? Because we've been going along uh, very successfully, almost. 300 years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly Judah, where the fortifications and the army were very successful in, in stemming off the, the evaders. But but now, now uh, if, if this were written during the exile or after the exile, uh, we have to ask you know, why? Uh, well, uh, let, let me let me let me back it back up just a little bit. Yeah. Let me back up just a little bit. Judah, Judah came under serious threat when the Assyrians were looming over the northern kingdom of Israel. Over the north, yes. Over the north, uh, Judah came under serious. I mean, they were in an existential crisis in that time too. That was, you know, that was 150 years before before mm -hmm. this Jeremiah stuff, um, they faced a genuine existential crisis. They managed 
to get through it. Uh, they managed to survive it, and ultimately they outlasted. <laughs> ultimately, they outlasted the Assyrians uh, because the Assyrians were in conflict, you know, with other empires and whatnot. Uh, but they were under Judah was under serious existential threat from the Assyrians. Israel, of, the northern kingdom of Israel, of course, fell to the Assyrians. Um, well, they blame that on Solomon too because yeah. he, he he fortified the south at. And and not the north, right? Let, let me let me uh, in the name of of uh, reading of doing something else with what we talk about today. Let me uh, let me recommend something. Uh, it's, Carl, it's very possible you have read this already, but let me recommend to all of you. I may have brought this up at the beginning of of this whole series, um, you know, half uh, six months ago, but. Um, the a book a book called the prophetic imagination the prophetic i have not, I have not read that okay but okay the, you, but the last you, time you, you recommended something i spent two days looking into it right <laughs> very you, productively i really appreciate that you, you would like this book I, okay. because i think because i think this book would really speak to the to the kinds of things that you you in particular are interested in um but it's called the prophetic mm -hmm. imagination and <clears throat> It's uh, and it's it's by the uh, longtime Columbia Seminary Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann, uh, B R U E G G E M A N N. Looks like Brueggemann. He he was a celebrity. I mean, he's still alive. Actually, he's no longer. He's still speaking. He does still do some speaking. Um, what's his first name? Uh, Walter. Walter. Walter, okay. Walter, Walter Brueggemann. And he was a, a kind of, he's kind of a theological celebrity. He's a, he is a big deal, capital B, capital D. Um, and, uh, but the prophetic imagination is a book he wrote, uh, originally wrote it back in the seventies. Uh, and he, I think it was republished, reissued like uh, 10 years ago as a 40th anniversary edition with a new a new preface and all of that um but what he does is he talks about well he's very interested in jeremiah for one thing he's very interested in in the the work of the prophets in general and jeremiah in particular but he contrasts the egalitarian vision of moses the egalitarian vision of Moses with the royal establishment of Solomon. Basically, basically says yeah. Solomon screwed it all up. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I know. I know that's what you're getting. That's why I'm bringing this up is because is because Moses had an egalitarian vision that is expressed in the law. In the cov in the in the covenant it, that this egalitarian vision is is laid out, um, and then Solomon comes along and institutes a a royal establishment, a royal bureaucracy that goes to support the bureaucracy, and the whole economy is directed towards towards the royal bureaucracy, and so you get a taste of that of 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 uh, later editorial editorializing upon that reality in uh in first samuel chapter eight uh in and, first samuel... And, and, and he uses the temple to support that bureaucracy right everything's right. woven together and that's where it all went wrong that's yes. where it all went wrong from the from the prophetic point of view thought taking a cue from the deuteronomistic interpretation of history um and so, uh, and so, reading Walter Brueggemann's *The Prophetic Imagination* would really give a lot of good extra insight into the kinds of theological commitment, the kind of theological and political commitment that Jeremiah had, uh, the kinds of assumptions that he had about God and the nation and reality. Um, really, really. Yeah, yeah, no, highly recommend. I highly recommend it to all of you because I think it would be very illuminating. Okay, I know that we need to probably start to wind up. However, um, 
let me uh, let me let me just uh, point out again that this the business about claiming to have a message from God when you in fact do not have a message from God. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the the purpose, really the point of, of this last this last half of chapter 23. Um, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of thing that did not end <laughs> with at the time of Jeremiah. <laughs> this is actually the original scriptural uh, premise or, or the original scriptural background to the commandment of not taking the Lord's name in vain. You know, the command, one of the Ten Commandments, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I, like probably all or most of you, probably always assumed that the commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain was essentially a commandment against cussing. That you don't cuss. <laughs> you don't say GD or F this or, you know, or whatever. You know, that you, you don't take the Lord's name in vain. If you do, if you, if you, if you say those things, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, you are. <laughs> I mean, when you say GD something, you are taking the Lord's name in vain and you shouldn't do it. Um, and, uh, but the original, <clears throat> the original scriptural root of that commandment is not primarily about that. It's not primarily about something like that. It's about the kind of thing that's going on here in Jeremiah 23. It's when you are claiming the Lord's authority for something that is not of the Lord. You're claiming the Lord's authority. You're using the Lord's name. You're, you're using the sort of using the Lord to prop up your program or your position or your whatever. You're using the Lord's name to do it when it is not the Lord's plan, when it is not, when it is not of the Lord, it is of you. It's of your own, your own imaginings uh, or your own prejudices or your own whatever. It's not of the Lord but you're using the Lord's name to back it. Um, empires throughout history have done it. When the Crusaders, when the Crusaders, you know, declared, you know, declared, uh, declared their crusades and, uh, and the Pope stands there and says, the Lord wills it. This is the will of the Lord. Go do the will of the Lord. You know, and then and then, you know, with the implicit permission to commit mass slaughter. Friends, that is not of the Lord. I mean, whatever other issues may have been going on and maybe things that maybe some things that God wasn't happy about, you know, going on elsewhere. Committing mm -hmm. mass slaughter, <clears throat> committing mass slaughter is not of the Lord. It's just not. And doing it, committing such atrocities in the name of the Lord is blasphemous. Um, Tom, it was of the Lord in several examples in the Old Testament, if we believe it. I mean, he orders them to go kill everything, even the chickens. And right. mass slaughter killed tens of thousands and the Lord ordered it. Yeah. So. I, you know, maybe they, maybe that's not true. Maybe the Lord well, didn't order it, but they, the Bible says the Lord did. So yeah, there's, I, there's, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. And those, those passages, I mean, in particularly in, in Joshua, I mean, we're, what we're mostly, what you're mostly talking about is, is Joshua. Um, you know, those are, those are subject to interpretation. <laughs> I mean, they're certainly subject to interpretation. Um <laughs> And and but you're right in 
the context of the book of Joshua, it is said to be commanded of the Lord. Now, you know, different interpreters, I say it's a matter of interpretation because different interpreters, you know, handle those kinds of texts in different ways. Uh, if I'm standing before a congregation and I have been assigned Joshua so-and-so um, and we sing Joshua fit the battle of Jericho or, uh, you know, or I'm reading about um, the destruction of I in, uh, you know, in, in the book of Joshua. I'm not entirely sure what I'd say, but I, I can tell you what I would not say. <laughs> what I would not say is that the Lord God Almighty and Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ ordered ordered the deaths of a whole bunch of innocent people or a whole bunch of a whole bunch of children anyway. Uh, I would not say that. There might be other things, other ways you can use the passage and, and all that. But in light of, I'll say, you know, in light of the gospel, in light of the New Testament, I cannot, I would not be able to interpret the book of Joshua so as to teach that God, you know, that God willed the deaths of the deaths of innocent people. Um uh, you know, and Tom, I I got a, a basic problem. If you're my priest, you know, you stand up and you say, "I God told me this, and here's what I'm telling you." And I'm the only. I have a choice. I can either say I don't believe it. I'm going to I'm going to go out and plow my field, mm -hmm. or uh, I can say, "What is my ethical base to judge what you told me?" Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it seems that it, in what we've been reading today, mm -hmm. the it's just well, I'm God, and I, I'm and because I say it, but how do I know you're saying it? There have, has to be <laughs> is it has to be something something. Is it the Ten Commandments from Moses, or is it love? Well, so can't you love one another as you love yeah. yourself. Yeah. Now, what Jeremiah? I mean, I I think if if you ask that question of Jeremiah. I think what Jeremiah would say is that he's received he's received the word of the Lord. I mean, he's had an experience. You know, he's right. He, I mean, he has spiritually received these these words. Um, but that I think that what he would say is that we have we have the law. We have the the covenant laid out for you know for us we have the covenant laid out in what for you know Jeremiah Deuteronomy was especially important in this in this respect um we have that and if you compare what the clear intent of the covenant as laid out in Deuteronomy is versus what the king the, the what the what the royal establishment and the priestly class what they're doing you can you can see grave disconnect between those things and then see the Babylonians at the door and then say, well, this is happening. We're in these dire straits because you're not, because you, the royal elite and the priestly class, are not fulfilling the divine terms, you know, the, the terms laid out in the covenant. That Sounds is, to me like they need a Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. You know, and that and that. You know, while, you know, from a human point of view, there's always, you know, there's always room for dispute and, and for arguing and that kind of thing. Jeremiah would certainly say, I think would certainly say is that you, you have an objective standard that is being broken, you know, that is being disregarded. And given his deuteronomistic theology, which connects obedience with success and disobedience with calamity, he would make the connection then between what he what he sees as clear covenant disobedience and now the fact that the people are under threat, he would make a connection between those two things mm -hmm. based on his deuteronomistic interpretation of history and of current events. He would make that connection 
and he would say what he what he says. Um, you know, I, I think to take it forward into the, uh, you know, into our own time, um, you know, if I'm standing up, if I'm standing up there in a pulpit and I'm saying, you know, directly or indirectly, I'm saying that such and such is the will of God. Uh, you've got a couple, you've got a couple of avenues there. You do have the Bible itself. Okay, you do have the scripture itself, but then there's the problem of how does one interpret the Bible? Because the Bible says lots of things. I mean, there are, there are lots of things the Bible says. The Bible seems in some places to support slavery, or at least not, or at least not to condemn it. Mm -hmm. um, but then it says other things in other places that seem to undermine slavery. You know, and you know, even if it doesn't explicitly say it's wrong, it. It, it would cultivate a world in which slavery would simply not happen. Um, and I think that that's where in the, in the Christian church, what the, the general rule has been is that we interpret, that we allow, we allow scripture to interpret scripture. We use our best understandings from outside the Bible to bring them into the Bible. That is to say, for example, if we if we have certain scientific understandings, certain understandings about the world, that we can bring those to bear on the text to understand it better. For example, to understand original historical intent and things like that. But then finally, and this is kind of, this is this is kind of vague, I get it, but but it's also, but I think it's helpful, is that we ultimately, as Christians, we ultimately interpret all statements against the love of God as demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ, um, that it ultimately comes back to Jesus Christ. And something may be biblical, something may be in the Bible, but I think the right question is, but is it Christ-like? Is it, is it of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this and this is where this is where we get into the question of how do we interpret something like Joshua? You know, something like those things in Joshua. You know, that's in the Bible. There's no question it's in the Bible and and the way it's told, the way the story is told, God in the story does in fact command Joshua and in fact punishes Joshua and the people for not completely destroying completely destroying one place. So there's that. But we ultimately have to judge all scripture in light of what we know in Jesus Christ. And I think any Christian would say that when in doubt, when in doubt, <laughs> go with Jesus. <laughs> go go with the revelation, revelation of God, the revelation of the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let that be the definitive word against which we judge anything else. And uh, and yes, that does lead sometimes lead us into certain conflicts with other parts of the Bible, perhaps, such as the book of Joshua. But I I do think that I do think that as Christians, we're on better ground if we just acknowledge that, acknowledge that and name it. You know, but uh, anyway, and, and use, fantastic question, fantastic point to raise. Tom, to use your words, then the Marcians got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. I absolutely. I yeah. You, you, you never explained it, but but you have now. Yeah. 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 But, but uh, also, also, uh, we're told quick, we got to go that, and just that, 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 that after the battle, you allow the widows to grieve for their husbands. You allow them to marry, in fact, and if they choose not to marry, to return to their lands. It's a, it's a, it's a much more compassionate situation of uh, how you handle the conquered. Right. There are, I was gonna say, even, even in those harsh, some of the apparently harsh portions of the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament, there's, there's often, there's often a, and they are sometimes are harsh, but but there, there's often a silver lining, or there's something that 
uh, superficial reading misses that is contextually kind of remarkable, you know, given given other circumstances, kind of contextually remarkable. So anyway, with that thought, we need to we need to sign off. So let's go ahead. Let's uh, let's pray, and then we will be on our way today. Let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for this day, for this chance to be together. We thank you for uh, this uh, these words in Jeremiah, which have uh, which challenge us in ways that continue to uh, continue to surprise us. Uh, continue to be surprised by their their relevance. Uh, their even though they're these are words that are twenty five hundred years old, they nevertheless speak to us very directly into our own lives today. Lord, we do pray <laughs> for all the people that we hold in our hearts all the times. We do we do lift up to you, uh, Sarah and Betty, and for uh, for for all others that we uh, that we. Uh, that we name before you in silence right now. And Lord, we pray for all those on our varied communities prayer lists. And we pray for those who are not on anyone's prayer list, but who are known and loved by you. And so be with us in this coming week. Guide us, guide us in everything. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.